Morning. As we continue our series about being created in the image of God, and I've been reflecting on it this week, you know, you think about all that God has given us to do. And it can overwhelm us, right? And if you start reading in Scripture about all the things God desires of you, and, you know, one of these days, maybe I'll just write a sermon and just list out all the things that God says, do this, do this, do this, do this, and it, and it can become a weight. It can become something that when you look at your life and compare it to the life that God expects from us, there are sometimes, and depending on the day, depending on the week, depending on the you know, uh, rut you may be in in life or the road you're on right now, that may seem vastly, vastly different than what your life actually looks like. And it can be cause for us to either change, do better, try to rely on God and His mercy and grace even more, or at times it can cause us to really want to just give up. It's too hard, it's too difficult, I can never measure up anyway. And, you know, every preacher gets up here and tells me how much I'm not doing, right? How much I can't do, how much I'm unwilling to do. And, you know, there's this overwhelming guilt that a lot that can come from a lot of pulpits. How dare you? And there's finger pointing all over the place and we do it to each other. We're always got higher expectations for others than we have for ourselves, right? Uh, we can overlook our faults and our flaws and the things that are wrong with us, but man, other people's, we choop, right? We can put under a microscope, and we can make them seem very big. <clears throat> I was supposed to preach this lesson last week, and one of our lovely members uh, told me that I was foolish, Charlotte's waving her hand, for going and to my family's house, driving back for Christmas, then driving back, so I'm preaching it today. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. I will say, though, Charlotte did kind of give me a blessing last week. Because normally, even when I'm not preaching here, I still feel like you're working. You know, you kind of still feel like you're on. And when you're at a different place, nobody's expecting absolutely anything from you. And you just kind of sit and worship. It felt really great to kind of be with my family and worship. So I tried to do that this morning, just zero in on what am I here for? Here to worship God because of why? because of Jesus. And so this morning, as we're looking at this idea of being created in the image of God, we've looked at how all of mankind failed. Israel, given special promises, failed. Yet there was this hope, if you read your Old Testament, of this person who would come, and he would be our Savior, or as the Jews would call, our Messiah. Now the Jews really only took that to mean... He was the Jewish Messiah who would restore the nation of Israel and make them conquer the world. And yet when Jesus actually came and revealed himself, the way he conquered and the way that he won and the one that he had victory is vastly different than what anybody expected. And so as we're in this part of our series, I ask the question, why did my Savior come to earth? And I am one who, the, fo the cross is a lot of times our focal point, which is great. The cross is a major focal point in the story of Scripture. Without the cross, there would be nothing. But sometimes we forget about other aspects of Jesus. Like as we looked at last week, Jesus had to not just go on the cross, but he had to be born in certain places. He had to be born from certain families. He had to do certain things while he was here. And if he didn't do them, it didn't matter if he went to the cross. If he did not fulfill all Scripture, then if he missed one point of Scripture that he did not fulfill, all of it is gone. A lot of times we focus on the cross, but what about three days later? When he rose. And then what about 50 days later when he ascended to the Father to sit on the right hand of God if he did not ascend? And if he was not put at the right hand of God and given all rule and authority and dominion over heaven and earth, then even that would not be enough. 
We weren't just looking for a sacrificial lamb to come and take away all of our problems. We were looking for God who came in the flesh to live out a perfect life, to keep the law, to live out a righteous life for us, yes, to die and to forgive us of our sins, but also to be raised so that we may have hope of resurrection, to ascend to the Father, to be that perfect high priest, so that he may look down on his people who are not measuring up, because we wake up in the morning, many mornings, and go, Lord, I am not enough within myself, and I need your mercy. And so we ask ourselves, why did Jesus come to earth? If you turn your Bibles to Matthew 1, you know, genealogies, a lot of times we, I would rather ignore a genealogy when you're reading. I, I'm, I'm sure people are starting their one-year Bible reading plan, and you're going to get to like Numbers, and you're going to get to Chronicles, and you're going to get to, you know, uh, Leviticus, and there's a lot of places you're going to want to skip, and genealogies just happen to be one of those. There's like seven chapters in Nehemiah. I'm going, what in the world's going on here, right? But there's, there's some profound things found in genealogies, and Matthew uses his genealogy, in my opinion, as a pattern of the genealogy found in Chronicles. If you read the first nine chapters of Chronicles, it is structured to go from Adam to Abraham, and then from Abraham to David, and then we have the life of David, and then guess how Second Chronicles ends? It ends with us, in Israel, in captivity. And it ends with a hope that somebody would restore us from captivity. No wonder why Chronicles was actually the Jewish, in the Jewish Bible, the last book of their Bible, because they were waiting for that son of Adam, that son of Abraham, right, who was born of God, who would come and deliver Israel from captivity. Because if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, yeah, they returned from captivity, but did they ever return? Was that messianic kingdom, that triumphal king who was going to come and establish a kingdom forever? Did he come before the time of Jesus? And so when you read the, chronolo the, the, chronologically, the, um, the chronology of Matthew, it's structured to take you from Adam to Abraham, from Abraham to David, from David to the captivity. And then in Matthew tells us this, as um, Joseph is being told from an angel why this is happening, turn your Bibles to Matthew 1.20, Joseph is considering these things, wondering what's going on. And as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And so not only do you have the son of Adam, who, which means Jesus can be an image bearer of God. Remember, Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. And then he passed that image on to Seth in Genesis chapter 5. And it was passed on from there on out. So Jesus, being a son of Adam, a God in the flesh, can also now reflect as not just God, but also as a human, what it means to bear God's image. And then we get to Abraham. And Abraham is given the son of promise. There is going to be someone who is born in the line of Abraham who would come and all nations would be blessed through him. Jesus, check. Now David, right? The son of David. Someone was going to come, 2 Samuel chapter 7, who was going to be from the lineage of David who would not only build the temple of God, he would also establish God's kingdom and that kingdom would never be destroyed well then mary being conceived from the spirit fulfills that genesis three fifteen seed promise from the seed of woman not from the seed of man but from the seed of woman and nobody expected for god to fulfill it this way when you think from the seed of woman oh yeah well women have to give birth well, God throws in a secondary fulfillment of that. Not only is it seed of woman, it's only seed of woman. God, the Spirit, comes and conceives in woman and fulfills it in a way no one ever expected. And Joseph is having to learn this. 
that this is what's going on. Oh, I thought my battery died. These were supposed to be up there. And then finally, look at verse 21. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's what his name means, by the way. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. What prophet? Well, there's Isaiah. But look at all the genealogy that we had. What prophet? Every prophet. Every prophet, in some way or another, looked forward to Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior, coming to this earth. Why? Because no matter what God does for people in a special way, with special promises and a special presence, will we live up? to being the image bearers of God. Every time we fail, on our own. On our own, we fail. Verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So now we have what we looked at the last time I preached, that there would be a man who is also God, as Job would said, my Redeemer comes from where? Heaven. And I know that one day he will have to take his stand here on earth. Here we see Jesus, God with us, my Redeemer from heaven, coming and taking his stand here on earth. But what was he doing while he was here? He was showing us exactly what the Father looks like. If you are to be have the image of God and you are supposed to bear the image of God, and you are supposed to be carrying on the mission of God and the glory of God and filling the earth with God's glory, who better you know? You better know God. And so far, we've known of God, we know commands of God, but have we seen God in action as if he was human living on this earth? No, Jesus is the first one to display that to us. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> this is a verse we go to often, um, but it's one that bears repeating. Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> Long ago, in many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So one time God spoke through all these prophets, but now he's speaking to us through whom? Through Jesus. Who is the dominant voice that needs to come through th from the text and from the Bible? Whose dominant voice needs to have supersede all other voices? It's Christ. One of the things you learn by looking at Jesus, though, is that all of those former prophets were also speaking the same things that he's saying. He's not saying anything new. He's retelling in a way. It's like in John 1, I'm not giving you a new commandment, and yet it is a new commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? Before you've heard it said, now you see what it looks like. In Jesus and in his life. Why? Because look at verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power, and after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I don't think we emphasize Jesus' kingship enough. Many times, and I'm not saying this is at fault, we emphasize his lambship or his saviorship or him being the Messiah, but he can only be the Messiah if he is also king, if he also has the ability to have all rule and all authority and to be God in the flesh. Jesus, had, it couldn't have been Moses. It couldn't have been David. It couldn't have been Daniel. It couldn't have been the best person that you know in your life, the person you think is the most righteous and the most godlike person in your life. They would not have cut it because they can't sit on the throne of God with all authority and all rule without being <laughs> cast down by God. So Jesus had to be God. And if you continue reading in Hebrews, I'm not going to read it all, but it's a great exercise for you guys to go do at home. 
that why he was exalted above the angels. He wasn't just another angel. He wasn't just another messenger. And that we think, mess- we think angels, and we don't think these people with wings. By the way, angels never described with wings, right? They were the sons of God in the Old Testament. They were the ones doing all the activity for God. You know, in Job 1, God's having a little powwow with all his sons of God, and Satan shows up to it, right? And they are the ones who God sends out in the earth to report on his behalf. And sometimes even to be rulers over nations as he takes care of Israel. Jesus is more than just another son of God. He is something different. He is something more. He is something, as Hebrews goes on to say, nobody else, no angel, as God ever said, son, come and sit on my right hand. And so he's something different. Go to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And that word firstborn, obviously was Jesus the one who was firstborn, as in order? Is he before Adam in this? No, firstborn means what? What does firstborn mean in the the Bible? The one who is given the preeminence, right? The one who is handed the double inheritance, the one who would take over after the father had gone, the one who the father trusted. And a lot of times the firstborn was not always the firstborn. Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn, but who got the firstborn promise? And so God is showing us that it's not necessarily order, but when Jesus came to this earth and died, and when he was not just dead, he also raised, he was raised from the dead, that he became the firstborn in order of preeminence. And so he is our Savior. Look at verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and and for us. Were all things created for us? What does it say? All things were created for him. So before we start going, God made this really nice world so that we could inhabit it. The first thing why all things were created was not for us. It was for him. He did not create us to glorify us. He created us so that we can glorify who? Who, is, who are we supposed to be glorifying? Who are we supposed to be imitating? Who are we, whose name should we be wearing and speaking all the days of our life? The name of Jesus. The name of Christ. And so even this creation, even the crowning of God's creation in mankind was created so that Jesus one day could be glorified through his own creation. I think sometimes we think very highly of ourselves. Why did God create us? <laughs> and we'd like to think uh, so he could give us a special place in heaven. No, 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 no. So we could glorify Jesus. Why is it when Jesus comes back, what is every knee going to do when Jesus comes back? Every knee will bow. Every knee will, every tongue will confess. Is that for us? Or is that for Jesus? Now, because Jesus is who he is, what does he want of us and for us? He wants salvation for us, doesn't he? That's why he came. Why did my Savior come to earth? He came because he loved us. And he wanted to spend eternity with us. But don't mistake, the Father's plan was so that the Father and the Son and the Spirit could be the one sitting on the throne, not us. And so our job is to worship Him. His job isn't to tailor everything to our needs. Sometimes I talk to people, and we're talking about religion, and they start saying, well, I don't really like this, and I don't really like that, and I don't think God would, and I don't think God would. You know what? It's not about you. It's not about what you want, what you like. I don't... In a sense, I don't really care. What I care about is how can I glorify the Father? And will I make mistakes doing that from time to time? Absolutely. But am I going to strive to do my Father's will? Well, if Jesus, who was the perfect image bearer, 
came and said, not my will, but your will be done. How arrogant do we think we are to think my will and not your will? Right? And so Jesus came and showed us what it looked like. Now, if we let it work, look at verse 19. And there's a lot of good stuff I'm skipping. I know, I'm sorry, but time is always on my back. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach for him. Thank God Jesus is who he is. Thank God that through us glorifying him and that all things were created to glorify him, he took that glorification. He said, I don't need it, right? Philippians chapter 2, he thought the thing, you know, the equality with God, he didn't think a thing to be grasped, so he let it go. He became a bondservant to serve the ones who ought to be serving him. And then we have the audacity to think, well, I don't want to serve that person. Jesus served his enemies. Jesus washed the feet of Judas. Think about that. Who's your Judas? Who's your Judas? Do you spend time talking about your Judas behind their back? Do you spend time trying to, you know, get back at your Judas? Well, I know Judas, he hurt me. Look at Peter. Jesus tells Peter, to my face, I'm going to watch you deny me before the rooster crows three times. In the most powerful scene, in my opinion, in Scripture, when it comes to human and God relation, is after Peter's denial. Who looks at him and sees him? Jesus. And yet Peter does something Judas doesn't. Because of the love that Jesus showed him, Showed the same to Judas, but Judas chose another path. Peter decided to repent and to change his ways and to give his entire life, even if it meant going to the same death that Jesus took. And we have from tradition, don't know if this is true or not, but it's tradition, that Peter was also put on a cross. And what did he ask? He asked to be put on a cross upside down because he didn't even want to be hung the same way that Jesus was hung. Knowing Peter, I believe that story. Or something similar happened. Sometimes I have to ask myself, has Jesus changed my life that profoundly? I don't think so. Not as much as I would like. Not as much as when I first started, when I was in preaching school, I couldn't wait to get to the work. I couldn't wait. I was on fire. I remember day one walking into the office in Meadville just going, I'm going to change the whole world. I think I've changed one person's life since then, <laughs> 12 years. And you just kind of get discouraged. And yet Jesus still loves me. No matter how many lives I've changed, that's, first of all, that's the wrong thinking on my end. I don't change anybody. Plant, water, who gives the increase? Who can make the change? You can lead a horse to water, but who has to drink? The Lord has to dunk their head in the water to drink. <laughs> right? Why did Jesus come to this earth? To save a wretch like me. This next verse, this next verse gets, just read it. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Okay. If I were to ask you, what is the gospel? And you said, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. That's not the gospel. The good news of Jesus, the gospel, is Jesus. 
the response to the gospel may be, right, is the hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. That's our response. That's after us hearing it. But the hearing of the gospel is the death, burial, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. And all the scripture being fulfilled in Jesus and Jesus being the king over the kingdom that he's establishing. It's the message of Jesus. That's why in Acts, what did they go on? What does it say they went preaching? They preached Jesus and the kingdom. And then in Acts 2, they asked, what must we do? Oh, you want to hear the response to the gospel? Here's what you've got to do to respond to it. But that within itself is not the gospel. When we sing gospel sermons, right, we think of ones that emphasize our part. The gospel emphasizes that your part would always fail and that without Jesus, you would have no hope. Paul says the gospel is that Jesus is the firstborn. Jesus is the exact imprint of the Father. Not us. Not that we don't respond, okay? It's not that we don't have some part to play but our part to play is only in recognition that if we were to do it on our own we would fail every time so in john 1 14 i'm not going to read all these john 14 what did jesus come to do what was his mission he came to reveal the father what's so important about the father john 17 tells us that eternal life is what? The knowledge of the Father. Well, what, would, what does knowledge of God have to do with us? Well, if you want to bear the image of God, who do you need to know? It gets back, who do you need to know? You need to know the Father. And the disciples in John 14 will show us the Father. I mean, that is the biggest face palm moment if Jesus ever was epic and awesome, I'm sure he did this in his own Jewish first century way, right? Our modern way would go, have I not been with you so long that if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Why? Because I do the works of the Father, and if you do the works that I do, you may have life. If you love me, keep my commandments. Why? Because my commandments are the Father's commandments, and I've given you the same mission the Father has given you. And in 2 Corinthians, let's go and read that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look what Paul has to say. After he's, you know, uh, chapter 3, he's let them kind of have it because they've been, been blinded by the Old Testament. They've been blinded by the law of Moses. They didn't understand its purpose. Its purpose was to bring forward Jesus who had removed the veil. So look at the very end of chapter 3. Look at verse 18, and we're going to bring this up in our next sermon. And with all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. Why did Jesus come? So that we could be transformed into his same image. Look at verse 3 of chapter 4. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, do we ever stop preaching even when people don't listen? Do we ever stop preaching? Do we ever stop preaching even if people misunderstand what we say? No. Do we ever stop preaching even if people accuse you, like Paul was accused, of being a slander, of being a, a snake, of being whatever people want to accuse you of being? Do you ever stop? Paul says, even if my gospel is veiled, I won't stop. It is veiled to those who are perishing, and in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What is the gospel again? Jesus being the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Where are you going to find the Father? In the face of Jesus, in the life of Jesus, in the words of Jesus, in the actions of Jesus. And so we ask ourselves as we interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis, how much of Jesus comes out and how much of the world comes out? 
right? All right, last place. Hebrews 7. <clears throat> One of the most probably misunderstood concepts of Jesus being both the royal high priest. The fact of the matter is, Hebrews 7, he is, takes on a mission like Melchizedek, right? Which means he can't be of the Levites. It means we got something different. We got something better. We've moved on, right, to something more. Jesus can be both priest and king. What does that mean? What does a priest do? What is the role of a priest? The role of a priest is to minister and to be a literally a mediator between two people. Why did Israel bring their sacrifice to the priest? What would the priest do with it? They would kill it, sprinkle the blood on the altar so that you can have forgiveness of sins. You had to go through somebody. But did the priest have the authority to forgive those sins within themselves? They had to trust the process, didn't they? Jesus not only has the mission of taking on our sins and forgiving our sins, he also has the authority to forgive them within himself. That is why when he was here on earth, what did he do? He forgave sins. He walked around and he even asked, what's harder for me to make the tell this man to get up and walk or to forgive him of his sins? I can do both. Why? I am God in the flesh. And what would they do? Pick up stones to try to kill him. Hebrews chapter 4. What does that mean to us? <clears throat> what does that mean to us? One of the things, and I don't fully grasp this, I don't get it. I'm going to be honest with you. How in the world was God tempted in all ways without sin? Something about putting on flesh allowed him to feel things he's never felt before. As a spirit. James 1 tells us God is spirit, therefore he cannot be what? He cannot be tempted. Jesus put on flesh, all of a sudden, he at least feels temptation. I'm not going to go into all what all that means because people get really upset about if you explain it one way or the other. But he can be merciful is the point. He walked this earth. You know what he knows? He knows how hard it is to forgive the Judas. When you watch Judas, who's in on your table eating dinner with you, eating dinner with you and then gets up from your dinner table to go and to sell you out for 30 pieces of silver. He just ate with them. Let him wash his feet. Heard the message of Jesus, and then behind his back, whoosh, knife. To watch people who you came and died for, to say, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Hang on the cross and watch them laugh and mock you and scorn you. To divide your clothes up. And then say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You ever have a hard day? You ever have a rough day? Maybe have a rough week. Maybe have a rough year. It's a new year. Great way to start it, right? <laughs> but when you think about this new year, if Jesus isn't in your plans, your plans stink. If Jesus isn't a part, if he's not a huge part of those plans, throw out whatever you've decided to do. Make, put him first. I'm thankful you guys are here this morning. But why can't you be here? Rick said it. Because Jesus came to this earth. And he loved us so much that he would die for our sins so that we could have eternal life, even though we don't deserve it. This morning, if you're not a Christian, if you've not given your life to Christ, if you haven't had your sins washed away in baptism, that's where we access the blood, right? How do you get the blood? The blood's been spilled, right? Jesus sacrificed himself. The blood's been spilled. Well, what separates the one who gets it and doesn't? Right? There's faith. But there are those, it says, who had faith in Jesus but wouldn't confess him, therefore walked away from him. Right? Faith is trust. That's what the word means in Greek. Trust, 
Do you trust Jesus? It would be like Moses saying, yeah, God, I trust you. We'll cross that Red Sea. I don't like those waters. But I have faith in you, God. I know you'll save me. And you don't walk. That's not the kind of faith that saves. The faith that saves is Abraham going, God, I know you've asked me to sacrifice my son. But I know you've made a promise that through this son, because I've already messed up with another son. I've already done messed that up. And you promised me this one, and I've been waiting, right? I've been waiting over almost 100 years. Me and Sarah, we're old, and we had a baby. And we only could have a baby, we know, because you gave us a baby. And you promised that this baby would be the child of promise, and now you're telling me to kill it. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But I know that either you're going to provide the sacrifice, or even if I go through it all the way and kill him, that you will raise him from the dead. Hebrews tells us that. That's faith. That's faith. This mere I believe, and I can sit back on my haunches and you know, maybe show up for Christmas, you know, uh, service once in a while, an Easter service thrown in there, you know, send some money around. It doesn't mean anything. Why? Because good deeds don't save you. Showing up to church, having perfect attendance doesn't save you. Jesus saves. And if you're a Christian this morning, and you've forgotten that, and you think, what? Put my money on a plate? I take the you know, little cup and the little piece of bread that I take and remember it, and that's all I need to do. It's a far cry from what Jesus did for your entire life. And it's hard to remember that on Monday. It really is. It's hard to remember that sometimes an hour after you leave worship and you've eaten lunch and you've had a good time. But it's important to remember. We remember the important things. My resolution or revolution, whatever you want to call it, is to remember Jesus every day. If I can do that, he'll help me along the way. Just remember Jesus. Every morning when you wake up, remember what he's done. Live your life for him the best that you can, knowing that he loves you. He's not looking to whop you upside the head every time you fall down. He will whop you upside the head. He told us so. He'll discipline us when we need it. But he does it because he loves you. If there's anything that you need this morning, we ask that you come forward. As we stand together and sing.